Hi, and welcome to episode 10 of the Bitcoin Brew, where we curate the latest cryptocurrency news and bring it straight to you. I'm Amy, and today I'm joined remotely by my co-host, Becca. But in the studio today, we have Ryan Harper, owner and founder of Harper Belmont Media, and the man behind all of our studio productions. Ryan, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. You know, it's funny because I've done a lot of these with Mike Llewellyn, and it's been six months since we've done one of those education pieces, uh, but I think he's coming this afternoon so we can film another one. So we start doing those education pieces again. So if you haven't checked those out, it is on the YouTube playlist. Uh, so if you don't understand anything about blockchain or Bitcoin, check out that series. Thank you, Ryan. This programming is in association with the Texas Blockchain Council, who is pushing policies that are Bitcoin and blockchain friendly here in Texas. We would love for you to like our show and possibly even subscribe. Here's what we'll be jumping into today. First of all, this week we saw Binance jump 17%. The crypto market cap exceeded $1 trillion on July 18th and Bitcoin had its best week since March. Also some juicy stuff, Three Arrows Capital, we talked about them on last week's show. They were on the run, they got apprehended this week. Today's topics are Samsung's latest breaking technology with a big potential for the mining industry. The Dutch government has fined Binance, a new custodial app. Oh wait, you were gonna talk to us about nine security tokens that got classified yes. by the SEC. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I can't just sit here. I gotta actually bring some value to the audience. Well, thank you for bringing a piece. And we'll talk about the ins and outs of Bitcoin ATMs. Right after this. Hello, hello. Thank you for watching this episode of The Bitcoin Brew. Um, my family had a little run-in with COVID this past week. Thankfully, everything's fine. Everybody's doing well. Um, but I missed filming in studio this past um, Friday. So um, th a huge thank you to Harper Belmont for working with uh, me, working remotely and getting this out there. Um, they are amazing and have done an incredible job. So the first topic that we're going to get into is the fact that Okay, if you're like me, you've heard more about semiconductors in the last year than ever before. Samsung is one of the world's biggest semiconductor manufacturers, and they announced that they are planning to expand their Texas facility and are investing $17 billion to make it possible. You might be wondering why I'm talking about this and why or how does it relate to Bitcoin? Well, semiconductors are the main processing unit in ASICs, which are the machines that are specific to mine Bitcoin. The latest ASIC model is called an S19. All right, so here is where it gets exciting. Not only is Samsung increasing production of semiconductors, they are making an even better model that can be used to mine Bitcoin, and this new chip is going to be faster and more energy efficient. So trials have already started, and I'm excited to see this new technology at work and if it really is going to be able to do what they think it's going to do. Thank you for that, Becca. I'm wondering, what are we going to call these new miners? We had the S9s, we had the S19s. Are we going to add another 10 and make it the S29? Well, to me, it's less about that and more about the fact that, hey, they're bringing, what what you say, 17, 19 billion dollar industry to Texas. And I think that has to do with the past couple years of chip shortage because, you know, COVID and all these material things. So yet again, something that's awesome for Texas and the economy of Texas. And, and I think that's just another reason why, like, uh, the TBC endorses, like, Gov uh, Governor Abbott because he is is welcoming businesses to come in and uh, uh as far as the chips and the technology i personally don't understand the technology enough to be able to like voice to that but if they're doing it specifically for the asics i think that's amazing and also just further solidifies uh bitcoin blockchain technology and and and, and va uh, evaluate value validate it validates I like that. And I was reading a little bit about this, that it is going to make the energy usage less. It's going to make them more efficient in the long run. Which is so. amazing. Yes. And if it, I didn't even know the, I mean, the energy aspect of it, because as you know, in Texas lately, it's gotten a little bit chilly in the winter and it's getting a little bit toasty in the summer. So electric is uh, getting more and more demand. Yes, there is. And also after they finalize this and get it out on the market, they're also looking to do a two nanometer 
two nanometers. A, so they went from I don't know what they that have means. The three nanometer is the size that they're working on to launch now. Oh, you mean the size of the chip? Yes. Oh my. And then it's going to be even. That's so small, I don't even know how to spell it. Exactly. <laughs> I have a piece I wanted to bring to you about Binance. Interesting okay. development overseas. The world's biggest crypto exchange, Binance, was fined by the Dutch government for operating in the Netherlands without authorization. They were fined 3.3 million euros, which converts to 3.4 million US dollars. The DNB warned the exchange in August of 2021 to register to conduct transactions there. Binance appealed the fine and has applied to get proper certification to conduct business. Europe is a large market from a cryptocurrency standpoint. 17% of our Europeans hold crypto. It's just under the global average of 23%. And Binance has already secured certification in Spain, Italy, and France. So this is a tone, a tone shift because they were operating outside of the law. Often they bragged about that and the fact that they don't have a headquarters. And I think personally, this is a smart move by Zhao. The industry is needing some trust right now in the current climate. And I'm wondering, do you think this is a true change of heart, Ryan, or is it just a smoke screen? Um, for me, it's hard to have conversations about Binance only because um, several months ago, there was some like altcoins that I was trying to get into. I'm sorry, don't kill me. But Binance at that time wasn't, I don't want to say the word legal or not legal because I'm not an attorney but wasn't available in Texas. So I don't know if the availability in Texas, if, if, they're, if you can get it yet. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So what piece did you bring us today? I'm well, so excited. Well then, the US Securities Exchange Commission has finally done it. They formally declared nine digital tokens as securities an ongoing practice of defining crypto oversight through enforcement actions. The SEC has identified cryptocurrencies as securities in that, in that past but only regarding settlements or enforcement actions with the crypto issuer. Thursday marks the first time that cryptocurrencies have been identified as securities without charging the issuer or even listing the currencies on the exchange. Thursday's complaint claims that former Coinbase product manager engaged in insider trading by tipping off friends and family about which asset would be listed on the exchange in the future. In the 62 page SEC complaint, Nine of the crypto assets were listed as securities. The document went through the nine tokens one by one to illustrate how each should be defined under Howey test as securities. The tokens listed were a AMP, Rally, Derivadex, XYO, Rari Governance Token, LCX, Power Ledger, Decentralized Foreign Exchange, and Chromatica. As far as the pronunciation of all those, I hope I got them right. The industry response seems to call for the SEC to detail how it would apply federal securities laws to crypto assets. A Coindesk blog from Thursday sums it up. Securities laws is thus not well suited to govern digital assets. Attempted application of such ill-fitting laws to crypto creates a number of problems. So my question to you, the reason that they're classifying these as securities is so that they can prosecute and have like a better defined a better defined word for this sort of insider trading? I, I think, well, A, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't fully answer what you just asked. I think you're, you're right. Um, securities, commodities, I think because the crypto is still so new, I know blockchain, Bitcoin started at 08, um, but it's still so new in terms of law. So I think they're just saying, hey, let's apply this thing that's been around for hundreds of years to this new thing. I do think there's gonna be an entirely new sort of, of law practice here in the future, just like there's gonna be an entirely new uh, energy sector specifically for Bitcoin. Um, now, are they doing the right thing? I don't know. I do think, like I just said earlier, I do think regulation, I do think uh, oversight needs to come into play because of these nine cryptos, are, are they good, are they bad? I don't know. Well, one thing that Becca brought to us a few weeks ago is that Gary Gensler classified Bitcoin as a commodity, which is separate from a security. And you and I were kind of talking about this before, but you know, we definitely need to firm up our definitions on those. But well, I feel like there's a big distinction here between those two terms. Well, yeah, yeah, because the security, the easiest way, the easiest way to think about it, 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 it give me give me some rope here. 
is if I'm a security, I'm buying rights to the farm, ownership of the farm. And a commodity, I'm buying rights to the corn that's being farmed. Yes. Does that make sense? I like that analogy. Yeah. You have either something tangible, physical, or you have more of an, I hate to say asset, but. What it is, is the fact that when you're buying Bitcoin, you're not, there's not a Bitcoin company. There's not a centralized Bitcoin company. But like when you're buying Ethereum or you're buying these, these, the nine uh, um, tokens listed, you're essentially buying into that, that organization. So for them to list them as securities, what they're saying is, hey, it's not necessarily a currency, it, you're buying into that company because it's, I would assume because it's centralized. I see what you're saying. And speaking of that, that's what Becca's gonna bring us. All right, so there's a group of developers and of course investors looking to solve what they would say is the final missing puzzle piece for Bitcoin mass adoption. But it's an app called Vediment, a community-based Bitcoin custody protocol. And so what are they trying to solve? They would say secure and easy to use self-custody. Fediment is an off-chain technology. Off-chain means not built on layer one of Bitcoin. And what it is, is basically an in-between from exchanges to self-custody, which can be somewhat cumbersome at the you know current stage that we're in. It seems like they think the older generation, this is the app talking what I've read and kind of what I've you know, taken away from what they've posted um, and talked about is they think that the older generation is hindering mass adoption because they think that it's more like tech savvy, if you will, younger individuals um, are helping the older generation who may be a little bit less tech savvy. This is definitely not across the board. So I guess that's possible, that might be true. But it seems like it's more of a, um, a knowledge problem or educational problem than anything else. Because whoever you are, if you truly understand the value of Bitcoin, then you learn how to manage it. In my personal experience, it's been opposite of what I just said. Of The older generation understands the value and the importance of security much more so than maybe a younger generation who thinks that, well, I can just call the help desk or, you know, start a new account, which isn't really how it works with Bitcoin. Okay, so this whole thing seems a little risky to me because one, it's a centralized database that would have and host your private keys. So that should be red flag number one. And two, you're essentially giving your Bitcoin for tokens issued by a third party. So at this point in the game, I wouldn't trust them to keep Bitcoin 100% secure. Basically what they're doing is creating a small trust with anonymity where Bitcoin is deposited and a, deposited and a token is minted. And I, I see what they're getting at for sure. I just, at the end of the day, I don't know if this is gonna be the answer that we're looking for. Although it's an incredible concept and I think it has some potential for sure. They have an impressive group of partners and they're planning to launch in Q1 of 2023. So I will be on the lookout for more news surrounding Fediment. Thank you for watching. Bitcoin ATMs, have you ever used one? No. Well, let me tell you. I don't have enough Bitcoin to use an ATM. Well, you can take your cash and turn it into Bitcoin. I don't have enough cash to turn it into Bitcoin. A Bitcoin ATM is a machine that closely resembles a typical ATM, but buys or sells your Bitcoin for cash. It is not connected to a bank, but is instead connected to the Bitcoin exchange. And there are two types, one way and two way. One way is for buying Bitcoin and two way is for purchasing or selling your Bitcoin. You can transact for yourself or sell funds to another person. Globally, there's about 35,000 ATMs. Here in Texas, we have around 4,000. Most of them, or many of them I know are in the HEBs south of us. And finding one near you is as easy as searching your zip code on the website coinatmradar.com. The fees can be steep, sometimes up to 20%, but typically more like five to 8%. And they do have a tendency to malfunction. But on the upside, they are private, easy to use, and convenient. You'll need your wallet address, or the address that you wish to send the funds to. Some red flags though for transacting, make sure you never enter your private key, huge red flag, and uh, make sure that you're never asked to move your funds to a third party wallet. So 
Uh, Do you think you'll consider using one after that little hell breakdown? Hell no. Like, first of all, I didn't, th there's 4,000 of them in Texas? Yes, there's literally one That's right insane. down the street from us. Have you ever gone to Out of 35,000 globally? Or was that 35,000 in the United States? 35,000 over the world, all over the world. And 4,000 of them are in Texas? Well, I'm telling you. That's insane. I think that's amazing. But what kills me is, oh, they have a tendency malfunction. And it's like, wait, what? That should be full stop. And I, and I left a piece out. They tend to malfunction and sometimes they'll just disappear. That's what the yeah. article said. <laughs> like, do people steal them or do I, they go back to the shop for well, services? <laughs> I don't even use, uh, the only ATM I will use for cash is the one that's connected to my bank. I'm not using an ATM at the gas station or the casino or the whatever, uh, you know, like, just because well, there's so many fees. scams. Yeah. Well, fees, but you, there's so many, I mean, Channel 8 reports of, you know, a card skimmer thingy. So 4,000 of these ATMs, I'm, I'm, I love the, the push, I love the, the drive, and I love the expansion of technology. But again, I think there's too much of a risk factor there. I don't know. There's one right down the street from our office. I want to go try it out. I said we take a field trip after the show. And take $1,000 and just risk 1000 Well, let's just try $10. $10. What right. a show. You'll have to report back to that. I certainly Check will. Check out Bitcoin Brew Instagram for the for the reel or the live of Amy losing ten dollars <laughs> to a malfunction on a Bitcoin ATM. I'm not saying I don't have that's not the TBC's take on Bitcoin ATM. That's just my personal take, only because I don't want to hear a malfunction when it comes to my money. Or my Bitcoin. Well, Ryan, thank you for joining us on the show. I have a few really good pieces of information I'd like to share with our viewers. Yeah. Our discount code is valid for our summit tickets. You can sign up now by using our discount code BTC brew for the number U, and that will get you 10% off your tickets. If you're members with us, talk to us, uh, you know, via email, we have a separate discount code for you. The price increase for everybody, members and viewers alike will increase at the end of next week. So snap those tickets up now. And we have a special interview following our show today featuring Nathan Kreider and Heather Pierce. They came all the way down from Kentucky last week to get some insight on how to build their own blockchain association. Yeah, and that meeting was really cool. Just because I think it just shows the, the, the movement of, of Bitcoin blockchain, not just in Texas, but nationally, and how, how much collaboration there is between the different organizations. Yes, I totally yeah. agree. And I loved hearing just kind of the origin story of the TBC. Mm -hmm like how it all got started. So thanks everybody for watching. We will see you next time. Not me though. <laughs> Hi, I'm here joined with Heather Pierce and Nathan Kreider. They are joining, they are, excuse me, creating their own blockchain association called SEBA. Can y'all tell us a little bit about that and uh, where you guys are based out of? Sure, um, I'm from Paducah, Kentucky and we are, um, and Nathan is from Lexington. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we are uh, beginning our new blockchain association, really hoping to educate and advocate for blockchain, cryptocurrency mining across Kentucky. And the Southeast. Southeast and, CBA stands for the South, Southeast Blockchain Association. Um, you know, Texas is obviously a major player in terms of Bitcoin mining, but a lot of people don't know that Kentucky and Georgia are round out the top three. And you've got other states like South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee that all have significant hash rates as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it won't be focused just on Bitcoin mining, but that's a that's a big piece of it. And that's where kind of a lot of the um, criticisms are coming from in terms of energy usage. And so we felt like it was important to put a group together to be proactive. And uh, especially when there's federal policy that's at play right now. Um, Kentucky also implemented some of the most um, crypto friendly um, uh, legislation a couple years ago. And so we want to kind of keep that momentum going in Kentucky and, and carry it on to Sometimes. other states in the Southeast. Beautiful. We had a wonderful meeting with you all today, getting to sit down, talk about what it takes to start an association mm -hmm. like you're hoping to do. My question is, what made you all reach out to the Texas Blockchain Council? Well, I mean, really, because you're, of your all success. I mean, you all seem to be doing it so well. You've had great, great momentum over the past two years, three years. And um, so we just really wanted to learn from you all how to do it well. 
you. Yeah, I would, I would just add that, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do an association. Mm -hmm. and it seems like you guys are really membership driven. You have enormous, I think well over a hundred members, um, corporate members, and then I think hundreds or even mm -hmm. thousands of individual members. Um, and that's important for us to grow a coalition uh, in the other southern states. Absolutely. And something that I think, Nathan, it was that you said and Lee, y'all were talking and you were saying both of you have a dog in the fight. Like, it's not like we're trying to keep information from you or you from us because y'all brought some really cool ideas that we hadn't considered in our association. So how are you hoping that this kind of dynamic and collaboration continues into other blockchain associations? Yeah, from my mm -hmm. perspective, the more collaboration, the better. Like we shouldn't, we shouldn't see it as a zero sum game where, you know, our membership is at the expense of yours. We're we're all. I mean, I think there'll be a lot of synergies among the groups and and a lot of um, members that are of both groups. And you know, if we want to be effective at the federal level, regional level, and the state level, we need to share best practices and ideas and and be like true allies. Okay. What would y'all say? What was your biggest takeaway from our meeting? What are you going to go home and start doing like tomorrow? Um, I would say work on membership, really. I think that seems like our, you know, you all have really set up a very good plan for that, really how to um, involve your members, really how to uh, take care of their needs. And I feel like we need to really set, set that plan in motion for our members as we kind of move forward with our with our plans. So I think that to me is our biggest, my biggest takeaway today. Yeah, for me, it would be like, tangible, concrete goals, maybe some policy, like you guys had your four mm -hmm. bills, you got two of those passed. So if we can find some specific things to get behind in different states, um, content creation like this, mm -hmm. um, marketing and, and getting the word out there. Um, and I think that it will, I think, yeah, those are probably my two biggest takeaways, yeah. yeah. We are so glad that you came to visit us and the Texas Blockchain Council wishes the Southeast Blockchain Association the best luck in the future. And we'll see you guys on the map very, very soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you for having Appreciate us. It. Our pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>